Hi, I'm Landon Darrens, the Senior Director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council, and we're here live in Sharm El Sheikh, uh, exploring uh, the outcomes and objectives of COP27 here in Egypt. I'm uh, really excited to be joined by Ambassador Payet, the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Energy Resources at the Department of State, uh, covering a broad mandate, but certainly geopolitics of energy. Uh, and there's never been a more dynamic time, I think, in energy markets, certainly not since the 1970s, uh, to kind of dig into these issues. Obviously, today we're looking at climate change and what's going on in COP, but I think these issues are, are increasingly interwoven. And uh, so we're really excited to have you here, Ambassador Pyatt. Uh, tell us, what, what are you looking to get uh, out of COP? What do you, what do you think the, uh, a win would be here in COP? No, well, th thanks, Landon. I, what I would start by emphasizing is my commitment, the State Department's commitment to doing everything that we can to advance President Biden's energy transition and climate agenda. But as you noted, my job in the ENR Bureau is really to focus on the geopolitics of energy, the nexus between our traditional energy security relationship and our broader diplomatic agenda, our support for our allies and partners around the world, the United States' interest in supporting a rules-based international order, where, as you said, energy is at the white-hot center of international affairs in a way that it has not been for a long time. Um, a big part of my message here at COP has been to emphasize the degree to which, in our view, these two agendas, energy mm. security, energy transition, are not in conflict with each other. In fact, they're mutually reinforcing. That is to say, we need to continue to work as the United States has done over many decades to build an energy system internationally, which helps our allies and partners to advance their economies, to deliver results for their citizens. But we also need to keep working on energy transition, the move away from fossil fuels towards renewables, recognizing that the best energy security of all is an energy system which is not dependent on countries like Russia, which has demonstrated so dramatically since February 24th, its willingness to weaponize its energy resources in a way that threatens our vital interests. So, so Ambassador, as you're walking around COP and you're talking and taking an assessment of what other global leaders, uh, industry, government leaders are taking, you know, saying about uh, both these geopol geopolitical maybe perhaps headwinds, and also the, the long-term ambition of our climate agenda. What's your assessment in terms of where uh, global consensus is right now in terms of how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is having an impact on uh, the broader climate agenda? So I think Russia will never again be viewed as re a reliable energy supplier. And one of the things that's so apparent to me here at COP and in all of my travels since I started this new role is the degree to which there is a consensus formed, especially in traditionally dependent markets like Europe, um, that there is no alternative but to diversify and decouple as fast as possible from Russian fossil fuels. Um, there is also great appreciation for the leadership that the United States is providing, um, the leadership that we've offered in the transatlantic context in terms of accelerating our own efforts to build energy linkages, mm -hmm. including LNG supplies with Europe, um, but also great appreciation for what's happening in the US. Uh, we should talk a little bit later about the Inflation Reduction Act sure. and, and what a game changer that has been, I think, in terms of America's reputation on these issues. Um, a recognition also that the US energy economy is at a particularly dynamic moment right now because of this transition that we're going through at home. You know, one of the ways I think about this is if you look back for the better part of 100 years, mm -hmm. energy has been central to America's influence and power around the world. The interesting thing about the moment we're in right now is that the form of that energy is increasingly being measured not in molecules, but in electrons. So right, right. my job and our job at the State Department is to make sure that that American leadership, which was so apparent during the fossil fuels era, think about how important our fossil fuel endowment was to the Allies' success mm -hmm. in the Second World War or the reconstruction of Europe um, in the late 40s and 50s, um, to ensure that in this new energy transition era, 
America's leadership and our partnership with our allies and, and friends remains just as strong. Um, and that's why you know, I've spent time here at COP talking with African partners, sure. uh, you know, a region which is so central to the critical minerals agenda and the resources that will be central to powering the energy transition era. So it's a really exciting time to be doing the ENR stuff because as you said, everything is in flux. Sure. But what America does and what we say matters. Well, it's interesting you bring up uh, the critical mineral supply chains in particular, because as we, we look to diversify energy sources and increase uh, global energy security, you know, uh, it's one thing to diverse away away from Russia, but obviously, you know, critical uh, supply chains have an impact and, and we have new powers globally around the world. How do you ensure that uh, the clean energy transition doesn't have the same features of, uh, of discord and, and uh, conflict that maybe are endemic in, in what Russia is doing in, in Russia or in Ukraine? So this is why the State Department has worked so hard to put together something we call the Mineral Security Partnership, which is aimed to bring together countries with, with an endowment of these critical minerals that are so important mm -hmm. to energy transition with countries that will be major consumers in the future. Our goal is to uphold high standards in terms of ESGs, to encourage engagement between American companies who, that are working in this space and the countries that have to make a choice. We want to offer an alternative. We're not coming in and saying, we, America, have all the answers. Mm -hmm. But if you deal with the United States, you're going to get transparency. You're going to get high standards in terms of environmental and social practices. And you're going to get a commitment to the long term. And that's what we're trying. That's the, the framework that we're trying to move ahead in. Um, I don't think that our geopolitical rivals can offer the same package. Sure. Um, coming into a country and putting a lot of money on the table and taking away a lot of rocks and doing the processing someplace else is not a good look. It's not a, and it's not a good formula for success. I'm also impressed, and again, this is especially true in so much of the developing world. Um, regions like Africa, mm -hmm. like South Asia, are confronted with the reality of the climate crisis every single day. Right. They see it impact in agriculture, in human living conditions, sure. in, in the, the challenges that they face in terms of economic development. Uh, they also recognize, and the United States recognizes, that the developing world has the same aspirations that we have in terms of having energy resources. As one of my interlocutors said to me, a lot of people, most people don't care where the energy comes from. <laughs> they just care that the lights come yeah. on. A and again, having spent a lot of my career in places like South Asia, um, where I've seen this and I've, I've seen the extraordinary economic tr transition that these sure. regions have gone through uh, because of digitization, because of global connective connectivity. Um, they have an opportunity to choose a different path and what's interesting to me is, in contrast to, say, even a decade ago, mm -hmm. now the price point of renewables has reached a moment where it is no longer a binary choice between fossil fuel development or no energy. There's an, another path, and this is why I was so encouraged to read the last Global Energy Outlook from the IEA because it made exactly this point that the global energy system has reached sure. a tipping has reached a tipping point uh, in terms of the attractiveness of renewable options. So you and I have, have discussed uh, just just putting uh, the United States more in focus. You and I have discussed uh, the importance of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, previously. And, you know, I think we're here with a global audience. And so a lot of a lot of our international counterparts might look at that as just a domestic piece of legislation. It's transformational, right? Three hundred sixty billion dollars plus over uh, over a decade to really transform the energy system in the United States. Uh, but how does that impact foreign policy? Where do you see that uh, helping helping the broader climate agenda? Globally? So first of all, of course, it gives us credibility when the United States argues for a climate first policy and energy transition we now are putting our, our money where our mouth is. Um, you know, ultimately, government policy is only a small part of the story here. 
What's really going to drive transition is the decisions of companies, of investors. That's why I'm so proud of the partnership that we have, the ENR Bureau, with some of our leading American companies. Um, we had a wonderful uh, event the other day for the Clean Energy Demand Initiative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was really proud of the fact that we have such a strong partnership there with Google, one of our tech companies. Sure. But the, the, you look at the other companies that were part of our presentation. We had companies in, in consumer goods, companies in, in heavy industrial manufactured goods, um, companies in services. And all of them were offering the same story about the value proposition of energy transition. Um, the IRA is going to accelerate that. A large incentive to faster innovation, faster deployment, faster transition. Um, and that is going to create opportunities for the global audience because it's going to create markets in the United States for foreign companies that are active in this space, but it's also gonna drive innovation, which is going to bring benefits to the international community. I always use the example, um, look at the federal government's investment in the space program in Apollo, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was substantially smaller than the investment that the IRA represents. But think about all of the transformations that brought in terms of microprocessors, advanced materials, aerospace, which were essential to putting a man on the moon, but over the past decades have filtered out into almost every aspect of life around the world. And I, I'm absolutely convinced that IRA is going to do the same thing, but it's also going to drive an extremely important change in terms of how we power our economies. Ambassador Pyatt, it has been great uh, to have you with us today, uh, to have this discussion. It's really exciting that, that there's so much opportunity and hope uh, on the horizon, uh, whether it's through the IRA or through broader di diplomatic efforts at the State Department. Uh, good luck here at COP. Thanks. And, uh, and we'll be excited to follow your, your adventure here. Great. Look forward to continuing the conversation, Landon, and, and seeing you around the world with our Atlantic Council partners. All right. Thanks so much.